if it hasn't been spooky enough, the year of 2020 has gotten darker this Halloween week as the boys creep across the looming graveyard of pop culture, passing the tombstones of dearly departed classics and defiled, rotting abominations. Our ghouls uncover the forbidden ingredients behind the bubbling cauldron of horror cinema. Be sure to like this episode and subscribe to our podcast. Stalk us on social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, and TikTok. Abandon all hope ye who continues to listen in on today's terrifying episode. <laughs> rolling? We rolling. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Good, the Bad, and the Boys podcast. We talk everything pop culture entertainment from movies to tv to games to memes we're your hosts i'm taryn i'm isaac thanks so much for tuning into our launch episodes last week our our three-part western series we got some we got some scary good stuff for you this week oh yes a happy halloween week genre yes happy halloween yeah it's the spooky month the spooky week yeah we are spooky we are coming season. at you with some good and bad of i don't know <laughs> i'm not sure what your genre is but yeah definitely the horror thriller genre of good and bad best and worst of well not bad there's there are things that are worse than this but this one was really bad this is a new one Oof. but yeah the good the good and bad of the horror genre i think we have some different subgenres of horror that we're bringing you but either way if you're looking for scares this is what to and what not to watch for sure <laughs> absolutely yeah so a little, little suggestions as you uh dive into the Halloween week. Spoiler filled suggestions. We should say. Yes, yes, this will all be spoilers probably. Uh, I'll try not to spoil too much, but uh no no promises. So, yes. I'll go through a quick spoiler-free version of the review and then get into yeah. get into why it's so bad with some spoilers. So, we'll Perfect. let you know. Yeah. So, stick around. Absolutely. So, I watched a two-parter. Um I decided to watch the original uh thing from another world from 1951. And then I went on to investigate uh, its cultural impact and the lead up to the 1982 The Thing, John Carpenter's. So, yeah, a cult classic. All right. You got some classics. Yeah. Absolutely. Cult films. Some good cult classics. Some good sci fi B movie and absolute horror slasher (laughs) film. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you got some sci fi body horror for us this week. Oh, yes. Good old 80s grotesque nightmares. So yeah, and uh, what what nightmare have you brought to us today, Taryn? <laughs> I brought the nightmare of uh, of my career choice, that's for sure. <laughs> as I watch bad movies, oh god, yeah, I got what I thought would be a slasher film, but uh, I could I think I could count the number of actual slashes that take place on one hand. <laughs> oh no, this was yeah, this is a movie that came out this year. It's called We Summon the Darkness. It's on Netflix. I should have been cued in as to the caliber of horror I was getting into when I saw that uh, Johnny Knoxville from Jackass Johnny was in Knoxville. it. Johnny Knoxville, that's that's insane. Johnny I can't Knoxville believe it. Baby. I can't believe he's in a in that type of movie. That's so funny. He's a, yeah, him. There's some big name actors in this one. There's like Alexandria Daddario from Baywatch. I think was the most recent oh, thing she yeah. was in. Oh okay. Yeah. Did they did they really summon the darkness in in your soul? Did they? Um, did, you, did you really feel? feel the, the, the they spooky summon ad- the darkness of my impending alcoholism <laughs> with the quality of movie that we <laughs> they summon the darkest reviews on the internet oh, is what God. they summoned yeah I, I don't blame you it really it did not look good at all i was looking at like the trailers and stuff and and i saw like their little um satanic uh i don't know I, i'm not sure if it was a ritual or what they were doing with the but they had their they're tied up they tied up the three three dudes and there's this whole yeah, confrontation I'll, or whatever. I'll get into why. Yeah, it's, yeah I watched uh, that. It yeah, didn't. It's based in it the, was really boring. <laughs> I, I will say. It was boring. There was yeah. no no scares to be had. No jump scares. No tension, which we I'm sure we could talk about with the thing, as yeah. to uh, you know great ways to build tension and suspense. Yes. Oh yes. Very Hitchcockian. That was not present. There's like yeah, it was one <laughs> of those like horror twist movies where it's like not what you expect at the ending but they like blew their load way too early uh, and they just yeah everything that they tried to do didn't work so oof but we'll get that's, into that's that very what should we discuss first 
I don't know. Should, should we bring the the spooky Anton in? Oh, God. To flip the spookiest again. of villains. The spookiest of villains. Yeah. Let's see. If it, do I have From a coin around Episode two, here? young Ant. <laughs> <laughs> a coin? I got my fiance's cell phone. Oh, okay. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. All right. No, here's a coin. Oh, you got it. Okay, cool. <laughs> call it. Call it. I'll call Tails this time. Tails. Ooh. All right, Tails. Building the suspension. Ooh. Ooh. What's it going to be? We built suspense about as good as we summon the darkness. <laughs> well done. It's Tails. It's so, Tails. All right. Once again, we're, we got the good going first. The good. The Hype good you up with, of... some, with some excellent body horror. Yes, wonderful. We can we can analyze what, what really works and what has set the slasher genre and, uh, and, and go into uh, the horrible modern take with Summon the Darkness. Oh, yeah. So we can just go through the yeah, timeline. <laughs> So that's perfect. <laughs> How horror movies have descended from, <laughs> descended. from back yes. in the day to modern day. Absolutely. Nice. So I guess to, to start, what, what would you say makes a good horror movie? Oh, a good horror movie? Uh, you know, George Lucas had a good technique of it, surprisingly. Um, and, mm. and perhaps I will get into that later, but it definitely has to do with uh, anticipation, tension building, um, the vagueness of the monster when it comes to a monster film. Some of those elements are what really really succeeds and uh going back to the original uh thing from another world we'll talk about uh the bleak cohen brothers themes which we've been on since uh day one of the podcast but yeah it's definitely this uh <laughs> definitely this bleak cohen brothers outlook on life um and i watched this in school actually at uh when it was film night of uh, the thing from another world and i was like oh okay that's interesting well sci-fi b movie so I went to go watch it, and there's kind of this like newfound appreciation that I have for some of these nostalgic films that have carried on into the present day, and I see its impact on like things, especially like Alien and um, just some of the techniques that they use um, that I think John Car- Carpenter kind of developed and took with him as well. So it's a, kind of this nice nostalgic appreciation of this film, and. Uh, yeah, it, it was like a decent blockbuster, like 50s blockbuster for its time. Something that had, you know, really big impact on, you know, George Lucas, Spielberg, Ridley Scott, too, James Cameron. Um, even uh, Scorsese actually admired this film, too, and its impact on its audience. And was actually, like, astounded by the audience's reaction to, like, the jump scares in this 50s movie. Which there's not really a lot but i can see what they mean by jump scares um but he was he was really he was really impacted by the just just how how much this movie impacted and knowing you know martin scorsese he, he doesn't really like those big blockbuster films he hates marvel hates thinks they're like a bunch of theme park attractions so it was interesting <laughs> for him to comment on this like sci-fi blockbuster of the 50s which was kind of cool yeah well this one really sort of broke the the mold of horror movies sort of and just like how it, it's approached to horror and all the new things that it developed yeah sort of for the genre oh for sure yeah even even most more so of like our understanding too of like alien life and extraterrestrial ideas and science and then of course this notable film you know led to its eventual remake in 82 and it's uh it's based on the 1938 novel who goes there which is a very ominous title and it's about an Arctic team who finds a crash shuttle, a um, little synopsis, and they, they, they find this being separated from its shuttle for some reason. And uh, by detonating their thermites um, to, to uncover it, they unleash the fires of hell upon themselves to engulf them with this unstoppable thing. I, I think this was definitely inspired by a lot of the early sci-fi writers and some of the media back in the day, like H.G. Wells with like War of the Worlds, maybe a little H.P. Lovecraftian. A uh, little like maybe like Jules Verne, who actually like inspired um, one of the filmmakers um, in like 1902. His name is George Melies, um, and he did his Trip to the Moon, um, really old silent film that like a bunch of people just go into this like uh, cannon and they just blast themselves to the moon and like discover the moon and its inhabitants. You can tell that this this was even going further with some of their ideas some of the media novels that you know they're they're used to and he kind of goes with it with with this novel uh, more change of what we understand with like space and, and there's also even some uh, frankenstein elements too uh little mary shelley Ooh. with you know the arctic and that whole like bleak um opening to frankenstein and this this creature that's lurking around in the arctic and ends up being frankenstein's monster of course but so there's definitely those type of themes, some old Victorian ideas that have really influenced this writer, I feel like. 
so yeah so that's nice. a little setup frankenstein is my favorite little, book yeah it's mine too actually <laughs> hey nice <laughs> beautifully written great great book great great understanding of what it means to be human and whatnot so if you guys are looking for something to read this week just read frankenstein um and then uh going into a little bit about john carpenter actually i'll, I'll get into that once we get to the 1982 but um there there is this tension that we get uh politically um you know this is the start of the cold war too era and then like the prelude to the space race so this you know we just finished a world war and we can kind of see the world war ii innovations being assimilated into society and stuff um and there's also okay. yeah so you know you, there's a little technological change little innovation and evolution of what we know and what our understanding of things and uh yeah and and during this time too right you know we just came from a world war and we got tensions with russia so there's like tensions of other nations it's a little increased there's a little anxiety about the xeno relations you know xeno relations yes so there's a (laughs) yes some scary commies among us who might snatch our bodies (laughs) yes (laughs) the red scare no i don't know but yes yeah (laughs) But yes. Human communists coming to get us. What better of an enemy of the U.S. than immigration itself? Immigration. Wow. Oh, God. Anyways, <laughs> the 50s, man. Oh, what, what a time. But uh, <laughs> What a time. The, even both films, too. Like, even, you know, because the Cold War is still going on in 1982. It doesn't end until Reagan's uh, term in 1991. So... Yeah, what James Cameron, he had like an interesting analysis of this type of mentality um, in, in this documentary about about thing from another world. He kind of put it as a, uh, a whack-a-mole theory in which successful civilizations will meet resistance and they will seek to like suppress and strike down uh, before it can rise up and consume and usurp the top of the food chain kind of thing. Uh, yeah, so the top dog, whenever they see someone... Like popping up to their level, they just yes. smack them back in line. Exactly, Team America, World Police style. Uh-huh. <laughs> God bless them. God bless America. God damn. But yes, so you know, it's this whole unfortunate, you know, human nature survival concept that we have, and um, so that kind of that kind of sets the tone that you know, and it definitely influenced how these scientists and military personas kind of how they handle you know these um, alien life and alien expeditions and whatnot so there's a lot of tensions a lot of concerns a lot of uh so getting into the movie i guess we can go into the opening which kind of sets up you know this bleak isolated kind of like a a daunting uh dreadful kind of environment with the arctic and there's like this like desolation there's a old spooky howling noises that you hear in like old movies and stuff nice and uh, and then and then it goes into where you go into the expedition base and and it kind of establishes this warm comforting environment um, with the expedition team and you know in, in the midst of this Arctic host- hostility and uh, it kind of kind of gives a statement of defiance you know by man against nature and death so it kind of builds that anticipation to be tested by the alien life later so it's like it's some stakes to threaten mankind with so. Um, you know, of course, it's the old horror movie trope of the radio silence. You know, they can't contact anyone, so they're they're isolated and uh, they're lonely and they're out. You know, they might yeah, they're they're definitely alone. So they have no help, no outside help. Um, so very horror movie. Yeah, for sure. So you so you're kind of a bit outmatched from this unknown person because you don't have outside help. You don't have additional supplies, ammunitions, anything. So it's it's very yeah, very very tense situation. Um, and just throughout this film too, it's kind of, it's, you know, humans are so stupid because there's like a horrible secrecy between the military and scientists of like their intentions, both of their intentions and their protocols. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it's just kind of this untroubling feeling of like deception on both sides. Um, I, I mean like, especially like the scientists. Yeah. Even the, like the reporter is shunned away. He can't, he can't report on the findings of the expedition, even though that's his job. But, um, yeah, so there's this kind of this interesting protocol, I guess. And, uh, I'm really glad that this alien isn't an airborne contagion like, uh, Prometheus and, and, uh, the Covenant movies or whatever, like alien movies. Cause like oh. with their equipment and their procedures, I think they'd be like long dead. <laughs> um, and it's like, <laughs> it'd make it too easy. Yeah. Yeah. It would be. And they're really almost as stupid as, as the, uh, Prometheus crew, I would say. Like they literally, <laughs> yeah. So they take the thing and he's encased in ice. You don't, you don't see it. Um, but you know he the stupid 
dude is like, ooh, this this uh, this guy is too too scary looking. So he puts a, a a heated electric blanket over it to cover his the sight of the thing, and he doesn't know that it's on. So he, I'm like, what are you doing, <laughs> you idiot? But yeah, so it's just horrible <laughs> protocols, and you're you're so astounded how these people have survived the frigidness of the Arctic, and it's just kind of funny. But I'm like, of course, the '50s OSHA. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Safety <laughs> measures. Yeah, <laughs> it's so stupid. But uh, and uh, that that kind of goes into back to the whole what makes a good horror film and George Lucas's take on it. Which is he? He said, you know, it, it takes um, building t- um, anticipation to sell a monster film. So you can't just show the monster outright. Uh, there needs to be clues and a build up to the creature, and it's just a, a matter of how clever you can be to set up moments um, and 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 trick the audience to create that illusion that it's real. So and and I, I feel like this movie does have a lot of good set up moments. Like even when the guy is looking through like the the ice and is. Uh, you know he's appalled by the sight of it. Uh, it does show the creature a little bit, but there's a little bit of um, a gloss over it, so you can't see it like in focus. So there's there's a little bit of this vagueness, so you don't know exactly what this creature is, what it looks like, what it really is, or what it does, its behaviors. Hmm. Kind of reminds me of um, sort of like the Hitchcock philosophy. Have you heard of like the bomb under the table thing that he says? Isn't it like the um, so- someone's gun? I forget what it's called, but it's it's like. It's kind of, yeah, well, yeah, there's like Chekhov's gun. Chekhov's gun, like maybe, or... You show a gun on the mantle, it has to go off. I was thinking for for, um, for Alfred Hitchcock, he says he has his bomb under the table oh, theory. Okay. Where if you show people, like, sitting at dinner, and then all of a sudden they explode, yeah, you'll get some shock value out of that. Um, mm. But it, it won't, you know, it won't really last with people. It's yeah, it won't shock last long. Jump scares, which we see a lot of today. Uh, but if, you know... If you start the scene off by showing a bomb under the table, counting down, and then you show the scene, you know, play out as it would, however you want to do it before it goes off. Right, yeah. Um, people looking for it, people not even knowing it's there, stuff like that. That builds more suspense, yeah. more dread. Maybe people about to leave, they come back. Just, you know, because you know something bad's going to happen. Right. Um, but you don't know exactly when. But you exactly just don't know when. how or why or when. Yeah, exactly. And that and that's just, yeah, that creates see. way a way better story you know that's way better storytelling than you know than than outright just yeah, yeah. so very yeah, yeah very hitchcock in bat. that way too yeah for sure yeah that's a good point so yeah yeah and you you know you you kind of see like sometimes it does show the creature but only for a brief second like there's a, a part where they open the door when the creature is let out you know when they open the door and they you see the creature for a moment and it tries to slash at them but then they slam the door like almost immediately so kind of it's it's kind of like trying to conceal, just showing us a glimpse of the monster, what its potential is, and then and then it just shoves it back so we don't really see exactly. So so we're getting clues and hints every time of like the nature of the creature, but it's always always suppressed. So it kind of we're still uncertain the entire time with uh, how it's gonna go. Mm. You know, there's there's a kind of like a little ominous uh, shot of the creature with his back turned in in the in the wilderness or you know the arctic and he's actually battling the dogs and stuff and you only see the back of its head you never see it's also like swarmed by the dogs too the dogs are trying to attack it as well which (laughs) it seems like in every every horror movie the dog always gets shit on and it's it's just not okay it's like in every like like from the babadook to i am legend like the dogs even like signs too the dog like always gets the short end and I'm just not okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> animal abuse. Yeah. Yeah. There's another, you know, little horror technique where they have the, the animal instincts like barking at it. It's sort of like a foreshadowing. Yeah, foreshadow, before. and and it a shows way to the just establish that something spooky's there yeah. without showing it. Oh, for sure, and it and it kind of brings a primal animalistic sense to the to the creature too, which is kind of spooky in itself. Um, and and there's mm-hmm. a great scene too. Um, it's this, it's this big body torch scene. Um, where they light the thing on fire, and it's a great special effects. I don't, I'm not really sure how they achieved it, but it was quite brilliant. It wasn't like a full body. Didn't they actually light the guy? Yeah, on fire? they they actually lit lit him on fire. Yeah, and it was the first time it was done. Yeah, they yeah exactly. It, it was it was quite insane. The great part about it is like you did see the outline of the creature and you saw the creature, but it was concealed by fire, so you still don't know its nature or like what it really looks like. And it's and that's such yeah, a even when you can see it, you can't. Exactly, it's it's such a good concealment. Yeah, 
When you do see the creature, though, it's definitely like this discounted plastic, like Frankenstein looking dude. Yeah, some big Frankenstein monster. Yeah, with your typical B sci fi fashion of <laughs> really kind of corny <laughs> effects and corny plastic uh, looks. But yeah. yeah. For a 50s movie, that was good that they knew to, you know, not show the creature and just yeah. kind of build the, the suspense of it beforehand. So, yeah. And even with scary movie monsters, like once they're seen, you know, in full light, it kind of detracts from it. I um, I saw a lot of most of the criticisms for what was that movie with Jim from The Office? <laughs> oh right, the uh, um, yeah, the the uh, the Quiet Place or whatever, a Quiet Place. Yes, a Quiet yeah. Place. Yeah, where they, you see the monsters right away, you know, like five minutes into the movie. That's so true. And it does yeah. sort of detract from the fear because in all that trailers, it was like, oh, don't make noise or terrible things yeah. will happen to you. But then you find out at the beginning, it's just like. Some monster will run up and and just kill you quick. Right, Those yeah, which, make noise. which totally detracts from the like mystery behind it, where you're like, what is the shape of this creature? What like what is its methods? Like how did it snatch up you know their child or you know like it would have been cool if yeah, they had some vague shots. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I totally agree. Yeah, it's really it's really great that this movie knew how to do that, considering it didn't really have too much to work off of or have those concepts in mind. So they kind of like kind of reinvigorated that. Nice, good horror concepts. And on the the thing about jump scares that you said, uh, I was watching a little bit on this video, and I guess sort of that horror technique. I know we're also just numb to it today because that's really all horror <laughs> right. movies do. Yeah, yeah, it's a right cheap way to scare. Scares. Yeah, I hate it. <laughs> but yeah, cheap way to scare. But back then, it was kind of a novel concept. Mm-hmm. Just, you know, the things popping out. Right, You know, yeah. all, like, the 30s horror movies were, like, monster movies. Absolutely. And, and it wasn't really... Yeah, uh, and, and Scorsese was like, yeah, that's the reaction you got. People were jumping out of their seats, you know, when this was when this was playing. And it's kind of cool, yeah. It's an interesting technique, yeah, for well, sure. And it works sometimes. Well overplayed today. Yeah, really when overplayed. When it's done right, but it's really... It works. Yeah, for sure. And I even feel, too, that um, the thing, 1982, I, I can't remember if there were any or not, but it really seemed like it was way smarter to use some other techniques rather than the jump scare method. But yeah. Well, the 1982 one was a lot of just like gore horror. Really. Yeah. Just sort of like the shock value. Yeah, it was very shock. Yeah. yeah it was just some insane, <laughs> insane <laughs> yeah. practical effects on that one. It really was. Yeah. Yeah, going back to the story of um, this author and, and this story had like a different and creative take on alien life and biology. Um, H.G. Wells, Mm -hmm. with its War of the Worlds, had, like, a nice, like, bacteria twist to it, where aliens died by our bacteria because they weren't immune. Yeah, this this kind of, I I feel like the, our understanding of the extraterrestrial life back in the 50s has kind of evolved into this more animalistic, I mean, it's still humanoid, but it resembles, communist. they they, they were talking about how it resembles a a plant life, (laughs) you know, it resembles a communist. (laughs) Yes, commies are, are aliens extraterrestrial alien menace will assimilate menace, yes and steal your jobs god damn it. <laughs> but yes they, they do the funny you know the witty 50s commentary of like it's a super carrot you know it's like a scientific approach that's kind of surprising at the time uh, and it's kind of breaking the molds of possibilities that many in the 50s would like consider to be unheard of which is it's pretty cool. I, I think I was, I was kind of kind of uh, impressed when I first watched it. I was like, oh, okay, even back in the 50s, they had this kind of more realistic sense of what alien life is. Like, it's not really as humanoid. It might be more plant-based. It might be more germ-based. It might be... So it was, it was kind of a cool little evolution of a that idea. A lot of ideas. the wildest, wildest sci-fi concepts came from, you know, the 20th century. Yeah. Especially, like, writers in, you know, like, 30s through 50s. Oh, definitely. There's a lot of wild stuff. Yeah, and... With our change of technology, you know, the Industrial Revolution, it just opened up a whole new th- another world of things. And so, but yeah, um, and, and there is a part, too, where the creature's hand gets uh, ripped off by one of the dogs, and they take it in for analysis, and that really reminded me. And it was, like, still flinching, too, and, and stuff. Um, and it was really reminiscent of um, the android doctor in Alien, uh, Ash, his analysis of the face hugger on the Nostromo there. It kind of, because, you know, the face hugger is kind of also in the shape of a hand, so... I, I feel like um, some borrowed kind of looks yeah. to the Ridley creature. Scott took a lot of inspiration from definitely from yeah. this movie and this movie especially, yeah, just for like the setting and how to build the tension. Yeah, around the yeah. ship. 
which is, man, is Alien is organism. one huge big anticipation build. Even like the beginning of Aliens too, I would say. Huge anticipation build. Probably one of the biggest ones. What was the most recent one? Covenant, where <laughs> yeah, it just Covenant. has the alien like walking around in broad daylight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It oh god. A genius crew. That that is that is not canon for me. Uh <laughs> That is not canon. <laughs> that is scariest uh, part of that movie was Michael Fassbender's homoerotic flute playing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was that was uh, was quite interesting. I, well, he was the best part of those movies. Luckily, I mean, he he's a great actor. But yeah, it's just man, he's he, even some of the X Men films are a miss too. So I feel bad for some yeah, of the movies he's, he's been he placed just, in. Yeah, I don't know how he picks his movies. <laughs> yeah, I I don't. Have you I seen don't him understand. in Assassin's Creed? <laughs> no, no, I didn't see the movie. Yeah, I. I heard really bad things on that one. Yeah. Oof. Ridley Scott definitely took some of these ideas uh, from this movie because it definitely has the parasitic, like, tendencies. Uh, it, like, rapidly p- reproduces into, like, these, like, pulsating plant pods, so very similar to, like, the alien's eggs and, like, the rapid growth mm-hmm. of the xenomorph. You know, they also feed on blood plasma, too, um, which, which is also a big thing, too, in the 1982 version. It's kind of like a, a very a very looming threat on our own like life source itself. Like and it hits us home. Like our blood is our life force and this is what the this plant life needs to survive and he only drains blood. He never he never like uh, consumes any other part of the of like humans and, and, and the, the, the poor dogs and stuff. But uh but yeah, I uh, the poor dog they found with no blood. <laughs> yes. That which I guess was also like a little jump scare too when they opened the Oh, one of yeah, the, the, dog the yeah the dog flew out of it yeah i mean it didn't scare me because i'm desensitized but <laughs> with my current <laughs> current current yeah. state Once you've of watched horror the conjuring films. series you're really just immune to jump scares yeah. at that oh, point oh gosh yeah yep it's like just 90 straight <laughs> minutes just, of it it really is that's all they that's all they have to offer really but uh it's like, yeah. Yeah. but yeah uh, and it's it's kind of funny too this idea of blood too um definitely probably inspired the little shop of horrors like 1960 which was supposed to be like a parody and farce off of the b sci-fi movies so they kind of played into that <laughs> and and the true antagonist though um i would say not not really the it's thing communist. but yes communist no <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe it's implied, but anyways, the uh, the true I'd antagonist. I'd say the implied antagonist is is in paranoia against each other, but this is the '50s, and I'm sure the yeah, audience nah, reaction they, was they did, that they yeah. were all they are reacted very appropriately to the situation. Yeah, I, I mean, yes, paranoia for sure, especially the the antagonist for the 1982, and then also the scientists and their ambitions are kind of more of the antagonist, and they they kind of lead to the downfall and demise. His his whole defense of trying to get to know the creature and not destroy it like the government wants to, he's just like knowledge is more important than life itself. For what purpose is living if not for for thought and learning? <laughs> and so I was like, oh, and he's like, we we owe it to science to stand here and die if we must. It, it, it it's kind of like Ridley Scott's uh, character of like Ash and uh, Fassbender. Yeah, for it sure. reminds me of the. What is it like, Wayland Corp? Or yeah, whatever, yeah, the Wayland, yeah, the the executive dude. He's trying to keep, keep the carrier back. <laughs> yeah, keep keep the creature alive and stuff. Uh, yeah, so he's like nuke it from orbit, and they're like, nah. And uh, yeah, there's there's this this kind of understanding, this obtaining of the superior life form. So yeah, there's there's no enemies in science. You know, there's only phenomena, is what he says. And I'm like, oof, okay. <laughs> Definitely a lot of alien parallels for sure with that, and uh, yeah, there's also a character named Ripley too in the movie. So I wonder if he named Ellen Ripley after after the characters from this movie. But Did so we just debunk Alien. It was a ripoff. Yes, I'll get to that. Yes. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yes. They do have this whole like aliens type scene where they set up the corridors and they set up the the hallways and to face the creature and. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of uh, interesting because because the technology of the time was a little primitive uh, compared to modern day standards. Um, it was kind of cool to see them try to work with what they had. A suggestion was to boil and fry the vegetable, so they just put a bunch of like electric coils together in the in the corridor. And there's kind of like this corridor set up uh, with their limited ammunition supplies and this claustrophobia feeling you you get in Alien in the Alien movies and stuff. And nice, yeah. Mm-hmm. I like how the slow burn is sort of 
built to that you know it starts out they're just stuck alone with it in the yeah, arctic absolutely. And, and it's kind of like the ultimate it. standoff against it it's like it's kind of it's kind of like it's you or me now you know we have to we have to figure this out you know and they, they also have like the tracking device too of um this like ra- radiation residual and it's like this little beeping tracking device which cameron totally used he, he even admitted it he like he used that whole gag and stuff and <laughs> also builds anticipation too because it's like you you it shows the location of you know the creature, but then when you go to investigate and it's not there, it kind of like subverts. And so a lot of the I think I feel like Aliens was kind of that way, and because they were like they're here, like where are they? And then then they look and they're up in the vents, so it's like a little subversion tactic that works out pretty well. Nice. We see the the spooky things there, but you can't see it. Um, doesn't doesn't really happen in this one. Uh, he 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 does show up at the end of the hallway and just walks towards him, and gets fried. Uh, which was pretty good effects for the time too. It had like the you know the, the whole like electric field going through him and stuff. And even when he dies and shrivels up, you still don't see the creature in its entirety. It's this this mass of uh, smoke and stuff at the end when it dies. So it it all even at the end you still don't get to see the creature fully or in detail. So another good subversion and, and that kind of makes it rewatchable in a way. Still don't really know what this creature is about, but. Also, with the technology that they used in the 50s, I wanted to see how the 1982 film would also um, handle with their modernization of technology. Because I'm like, in the 80s, it was a little more advanced. We had more things. So I'm like, how is this creature going to um, challenge that and go even further? If you, if you have all these sci-fi weapons, which I feel like Aliens did really well, too. Um, you have all these sci-fi weapons, but there's there's got to be some type of edge that the creature gives. Yeah, just to keep it as a as a threat, keep the stakes right, high. Right, exactly. So so I was I was curious to see that, and and the eight, eighty-two thing actually does succeed in that, which I'll get to later. In Among Us, the movie. Oh yes, uh, Mafia or whatever <laughs> feels like, but uh, <laughs> and uh, similar to. Really, really, every scientist in all the movies throughout, like even in Alien, they just get a nice vibe check that he tries to communicate with the creature, and the creature just swats him aside. An unfortunate uh, nature takes its course as we've as we've looked into. No matter no matter just your like intentions, in Prometheus. yes, Prometheus and all that, exactly, get vibe checked. Ash even kind of gets vibe checked too in the original Alien. So does the business executive in Aliens. Yeah, this this film was pretty good. It explored pretty deep themes for the time, and and good good shots, good effects, and yeah, it was good good techniques which hadn't been done before. And this might be the cause of the the infinite amount of jump scares we get today. But jump scares this this movie did to horror films what Star Wars did to everything else. <laughs> yes. it, just, it just killed it. Absolutely ruined it. Really did. So there you have it. Yeah. So and. There is a bunch of throwaway characters in this, too. It's more about the plot and succession of events. They do attempt to yeah. humanize two of the characters, the captain and this other, like, secretary um, analyst or whatever. And um, I, I'm actually surprised, because it is the 50s, but they had an attempt at feminism a little bit. Heresy. You know, <laughs> heresy. Was it the communist alien? <laughs> no, no. It was actually the, the love interest of the captain. So he was, he was kind of like, flirting around with her and he's like well hey you know we should hang out you know we we dated in the past you know why can't it work out now and she's like all right well you can come to my room and he's like well i promise you know i won't be handsy i'll bring a rope and then the scene pans and he's actually tied (laughs) tied down to the chair and i I don't know if there's like a weird dominatrix vibe to that or something but she was totally in control in that situation she wouldn't like let him go and stuff it was it was kind of weird it was interesting I, I'm not sure what the implications are with that one. It might have been a little 50s uh, joke that I'm not getting. No, but, keep talking to Todd. <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> but, yes. Yeah, she actually does hold her own uh, against the thing. Uh, she actually, like, holds up a mattress. She isn't, like, screaming at the top of her lungs like any other woman in the 50s. So she held her own pretty pretty well. Uh, yeah, the old, the old 30s horror movie <laughs> yes. woman. They're just yes. there to, to scream. Exactly. The slasher so film she, girl. So she didn't do that, and she was pretty smart. She actually uh, suggested to boil and fry the, the vegetable itself. And I, Well, <laughs> I don't know if that was a, a kitchen joke, though. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> you forget it's the 50s. So... They had to reestablish that she wasn't a, a communist spy or the thing itself. Right. 50s Western cinema. They're like, don't worry, guys. 
Don't worry, guys. We get we got. Uh, but yes. How were so the, uh, how the performances? Uh, so performances far? were kind of stale. There, it was definitely a low, low acting. It was more about the plot for sure. If they, um, I, I will say the captain not too bad, and the love interest she was pretty good. She she actually did act. She wasn't very stoic, because you know you had the fifties like deadpan faces and stuff. There's a lot of that in this, um, and they talk really fast too, and they have. Uh, they have all these, like, witty 50s jokes, and their dialogue just goes super fast. It's just, <laughs> it's just kind of stupid. but uh, <laughs> It's a Marvel horror movie. Yeah, pretty Everyone's much. Cracking jokes. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty much that. And and they kind of do a lot of wink-wink nods to the audience when they... Yeah, they, they say the thing a lot, which, I, I mean, when describing a creature you can't understand, like, I understand that, but it was kind of... It, it it happened like almost back to back a lot in some some scenes, and I'm like, oh, they said it. They said the thing. They said They'll the title. They they did it. <laughs> they said the thing. They Roll said credits. The thing. Roll credits. Yes. Yeah. And and there was like little meta jokes of like where they're joking around. They're like, yeah, read a read a horror story. And I, I don't know. It's not it's not like scream or anything, but it, it, there's some meta elements where they're like nod nod to the audience. So I'm like, ah. Oh. So I wonder what, how many thing mentions of the thing there are. I, I need a thing count. I didn't count them, but need a thing count. If you guys know how many times they say the thing in that movie, let me know. <laughs> Comment below. I need a thing count, but yes. So enough about that movie. We'll go go into the 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 eighties and John Carpenter himself. Yes, this is this is a good. This is a spicy one. Oh yes, this is a. Gosh, I'm still traumatized from two days ago. <laughs> when I watched it, <laughs> it's, it's a special uh, effects. Yeah, it was it was quite shocking, really. Um, yeah, a little bit on John Carpenter too. He actually did work with uh, Dan o- O'Bannon um, when they did the movie Dark Star in like 1974, and uh, oh. he actually borrowed some of that aspects and went to write Alien in '79. So, <laughs> so Dan, Dan O'Bannon Alien just, is just a collection of stolen. It ideas. really is. <laughs> Yes, uh, yes, it's all it's all a bunch of rehashing, all a bunch of stolen things, and uh, but yeah, so I wonder if it works so well. Is this the best ideas from other horror movies? Yeah. Oh God, John Carpenter too went went on to direct Halloween in 1978, which was awesome, and it developed the slasher genre. That is a, that's the slasher. Yeah, movie. I, I should have watched this weekend. Oh, for sure. There's still time. Still got like what six days. <laughs> Yeah, so Halloween was great, and what I love, too, about Halloween is that, yeah, he uses great techniques where there's not, he doesn't rely on jump scares, and, uh, like, like there's even a, a moment where the detective is looking at the house of the Myers, and then, and then a hand comes up to, like, to, to address him, and that's, that's quite a big jump scare for the time, you know, Michael Myers wasn't even there, you know, the monster wasn't even there, it was just another detective kind of getting his attention, so it's very subtle things like that where, it like, really puts you on edge, and he's just, he's really good at that. And I feel like this movie, too, was very much... Yeah, it didn't rely heavy on that. It was more for shock value, but... Yeah. It also did a good job building suspense, you know, like through the paranoia of the crew um, and just the concept of that one, how the thing yeah. sort of, like, infects people. Exactly, yeah. Psychologically and, you know, and physically. But unfortunately, this this movie came out um, two weeks prior to E.T., which gave the optimistic family persona of alien visitation <laughs> and might have bombed the film <laughs> with that family alien if i think if it was uh, released at any other point it might have might have been good but john carpenter that was his first financial disappointment but you know a lot of people love it i certainly loved this movie and it became an instant cult classic so it was uh, and I, I guess too it's also a first part in a trilogy of his that's like equally depressing and nihilistic and the other two are the prince of darkness and in the mouth of madness so i'll have to check those out see if they're as i thought you were gonna say et was the second et <laughs> yes the 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 um, et prince of darkness <laughs> et prince of darkness uh i want to see that movie <laughs> no but uh yeah and, and and i've noticed too he john carpenter kind of elaborates or or not elaborate. It collaborates with uh, Kurt Russell a lot too. It's kind of his. I think if that's his like go-to actor because he was in Escape from New York and Big Trouble in Little China, which were also his films. Hmm. And uh, yeah, Kurt is he. He really likes Kurt Russell. So who doesn't? Who doesn't? Kurt Russell, Mr. Ego himself. 
Sorry, no, that wasn't that wasn't a, a jab at his ego. He he literally plays ego, the living planet. But yes, he literally <laughs> is ego. He literally is ego. Um, yeah, there's still that Russian, you know, anxiety. And actually, I guess the uh, I guess the Norwegians were um, bad guys in this one. I guess to this not this movie is more faithful to John Campbell's novel too. So this is a little more faithful to the book, oh, a little okay. better of an adaptation. The score too yeah. is by our favorite Ennio Morricone himself wow. um so everything's just fallen into place this is quite enlightening well yeah no matter what we do we can't we can't escape the west <laughs> we, we, we cannot We've talked about standoffs and my we, boy yeah uh, 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 yeah i'm sorry folks uh i promised this, this wouldn't be an entirely podcast, yeah we promise <laughs> we promise this is pulp, pop culture <laughs> we're diving into the horror genre we're really trying we're, we probably won't talk about westerns for the rest of the year hopefully probably will be brought up who knows but yes, <laughs> but <laughs> not until next week. But at, yeah, not not until next week. Hopefully not. But yes, can't fight nature. God damn it! I'm quoting westerns. Yeah, but Morricone, he kind of had like this Jaws esque theme too. It's like a little like one note, dun 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 dun, like probably the entire oh, okay. time. Um, and it's yeah, it's, you know, it's like anticipation build, um, little, little like tiptoe stalking feeling. And actually, the rest of the film has a lot of silence. There's only like key moments where that theme plays and it doesn't play very often so it's it's very rarely used but when it does it really it's really quite spooky you just feel like there's something creeping up just don't know what it is just to add on to uh plagiarism um the opening is very much like the predator in 1987 so the predator (laughs) kind of borrowed its uh opening with the spaceship orbiting earth and (laughs) stuff that's what it reminded me of i was like oh Looks like the predator makes uh, makes sense. There was an Alien versus Predator movie. Yes, that the two ripoffs should collide. Yeah, uh, of course. So who can who can riff <laughs> or better? Exactly. Yeah, fight to the death on who's superior in their plagiarism. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, and and I, I do love like even the fifties the the title crawl um, the the burning of the title is quite quite fun. Um, you know, it's kind of shows the how to kill the creature. I guess it's like a little little. Uh, little clue nice, yeah the, I mean, that's like, the most yeah. iconic imagery from really is yeah from the movie yeah is the thing burning exactly yeah the burning um the electrocution aspect of it from the 50s uh yeah there's there's kind of this glowing ominous like ghostly aura that it gives off to so it's quite spooky really really great really great title crawl i love it so it does establish the arctic a little bit and it was filmed in alaska and alaska's quite pretty so i felt like the opening was way too saturated and beautiful because the old movie had like this desolate arctic vibe to it so i feel like this was a little too saturated when it opened i mean it kind of i I forgave it because like a, a storm kind of hit too right once shit was hitting the fan and then it became really frigid and 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 cold so Maybe that's what they were going for. It's like this nice little innocent, calming, comforting setting, and then it just goes right, you know, goes right into the horrid frigidness. The environment. The environment. Like reflects the themes. Yeah, exactly. The, yeah. The plot of the show. So, so I forgave it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, okay, I see what they were trying to go for. But at the beginning, I was like, man, this is such pretty shots. Like, this is, I'm not scared right now. So I don't understand. I was a little confused. I'm not scared right now. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, and I mean, I mean, but, they're yeah, even. I like what this one did with the monster. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> it's it <was> so horrific. <laughs> yeah. Not just the very grotesque monster design, which was, which was really good, but just that it wasn't like kind of the, the solely unstoppable killing machine. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah, in, you uh, could still, the other one. you could still burn it. It'll, I mean, it will still try to get away, but yeah, exactly. It was, it was more, it was more vulnerable. Yeah. So it had to hide among people. Exactly. And that was almost scarier yeah yeah are there any communists in this one there isn't there's a bunch of norwegians this time and uh yeah they're chasing after a dog mm. too of course it's always the dog <laughs> um i just can't can't escape from that the dogs get yeah, they, especially shit oh on my in God, this movie it's so bad the so the norwegians are going after this dog they're trying to kill it because it's carrying the contagion um and the helicopter it has the worst outing of the helicopter this norwegian tries to throw a grenade at the dog it slips out of his hand lands to the helicopter and it blows up 
And I'm like, that is the laziest. So I was a little scared there because I thought that was such that was like the laziest outing of the helicopter and the Norwegians. There should have been more of a shootout because one of the Norwegians is really desperately trying to get this dog and then he gets shot. Um, and I'm like, why didn't we have that <laughs> as like the reason why, like, you know, they shoot down the helicopter and, you know, like, I, I don't know. Because, you know, there's obviously this misunderstanding. They they don't even care who's in line of fire. They're just firing at this dog, hoping to just to kill the thing. And they don't care who, like, even, even one of the Arctic Expedition base members just gets shot by one of the Norwegians just because he was in the line of fire. And they were just so desperate to kill this thing. But it was just such a stupid moment. I'm like, how did that happen? How did you slip with that grenade? Like, he, he literally threw it behind him to, like build up the throw <laughs> to throw it at the dog but then he just it slipped behind him i'm like oh my god he, that's so i was a little scared i was like is this movie gonna like be the, that cheesy it's like in wee bowling yeah exactly it was exactly it that exactly <laughs> what happened goes, ah! it's exactly what happened <laughs> oh my god i'm not even kidding and that and that's what really sets the psychological aspect to it is that you know there's there's just kind of this cabin fever tension that they get and this guy's being stitched up by you know because he got shot and they're just like, all right, first goddamn week of winter. <laughs> so there's this, like, nice, dreary expectation of what's to come. And Superstitious Plays, too, by Stevie Wonder, which I thought that was a little on the nose. But, but yeah, it just definitely <laughs> sets, sets that it up. It is the 80s. <laughs> yeah, it's the, right, yeah. Little 80s, uh, they, they look at the horribly exploded helicopter that was so unnecessary. But they check out the helicopter. They go to the Norwegian outpost, and there's this horrible investigation of Arctic base just completely demolished, um, frozen. Like, this guy, like, slit his throat and, and arms and, like, frozen blood and stuff. And it was, it was quite grotesque. Mm, nice. Um, so good, good stuff. It, it yeah. sort of establishes the capabilities of this thing. Yeah, exactly. How, what could happen right. without showing it. The movie kind of expects you to kind of know about the other movie, like back in the 50s, to where it doesn't like rehash everything, but it tells you in a, in a it gives you exposition in a good, um, smart way. And where you see the aftermath of the space, you see, they, you know, they go through the VHS tapes and you see what they found in the circle and stuff and their whole expedition. So they don't rehash the same story that we're already familiar with. They, you know, it's, it's all pretty smart exposition gosh they're investigating so you these... don't really need to see the first movie to watch yeah this yeah one. you don't really need to yeah because the yeah they they give good exposition to on yeah so they, yeah they 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 cover it pretty much pretty good but um so they bring back some of the charred bodies and they see a whole bunch of kerosene so that's just like a little, little clue on how to kill this thing <laughs> their scientific protocols again are shit and this dude is like sniffing and touching like this this charred clothing just to like see what <laughs> like just to see the consistency <laughs> or something and, he, and then he immediately touches his pencil yeah pass. <laughs> exactly and then he's been putting this pencil in his mouth and using it so i'm like oh god yeah so it's like this total so good thing it's not airborne it's more of like through contact i don't know it was it was just bad a bit more hands-on yeah infection. a little more yeah a little more hands-on but i mean given their equipment i mean they are only like an arctic expedition base they don't really have too much to work off of but like <laughs> still like have a little bit of some hygiene you know <laughs> but mm. so um but yeah then you know gosh just seeing the distorted charred bodies and that's that just shows you the brilliance of rob botten who was the practical effects he has that nice 80s grotesque horrific shocking bodily charm that's like evident that guy needs help he really does he yes he does <laughs> the effects his designs for imagination this movie. he needs therapy for sure it is very alien for sure and just how it like just contorts whatever it gets its hands on and just the creativity of how it shows yeah. infecting people gosh yeah I, like what was your favorite uh alien grab from that movie i think the whole dog pen scene was probably it was the most disturbing but well executed like it just it seemed the most animalistic and parasitic in that moment or, oh with like spider legs come out of it oh yeah yeah like... i liked yeah i liked that aspect yeah the spider legs it like extending itself above you know the dude's um stomach and you know it was just like oh man that was it's a very iconic shot but yeah that was probably one of my favorites is the dog pen i mean it was horrible but I, I didn't like the ending, the end form of it uh, in the caves. It was it was a little too like comically dis distorted. It just didn't work for me. But uh, but the rest of 
the film and it's for it was it was pretty good yeah unfortunately too he 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 got like 1.5 million dollars to do it and it definitely paid off well i mean it didn't really pay off because the movie bombed but you could definitely tell there was a lot of work that was put into it so they make the most of their money really good. yeah they it really does do. have really good production value you could yeah it really does tell. it looks yeah. like it's uh the arctic oh for sure yeah you can you can definitely yeah you you understand the situation and you believe it and he he kind of got shit on too with his practical effects too um it was very poorly received as repulsive excessive wretched excess poorly <laughs> realized and instant junk and if they were repulsed by it i think he did his job so i think that means it works <laughs> i think it means yeah, works that yeah seemed like the goal exactly so the dog scene was just crazy i mean there's all that moral tension of like they're like shouting at each other like stop shooting at the other dogs even though they're trying to put them out of their misery there's a lot of moral tensions like how far they're, they're gonna go to survive or you know are their morals gonna doom them yeah it's it sort so of establishes the the stakes within the crew like and their psychology trust, of trust the paranoia yeah exactly and it's just so gnarly it's an anamorphic nightmare <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the horrific is. shrieks the high-pitched like insect chirping that's the awesome thing about the design is that there's absolutely like no logic to its physiology and it's very unpredictable which it really passes as that challenge that's what i was looking for because of their updated technology yeah. they that that type of creature really challenges yeah like what you're saying about don't show the monster too early i think this movie could get away with that it can, the monster yeah. changes every time you see it you don't know what it's going to look right. like, and you don't know how it's going to kill people. It could turn into that weird spider thing. Yeah, and web it could up be the whatever. The next time someone's alone with it. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It, 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 it just exactly it does break that um, anticipation concept a little bit, but it it enhances it in a way of like, yeah, you just don't know its form. You don't know what it's going to be. Who is it going to be? Yeah. That whole psychological who done it kind of thing. You know, there's so much. Yeah, the much. stakes it builds, like you don't know who 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 it is, so you don't really. The tension's high for the whole movie because you don't yeah. know when two people are alone together if one of them's just going to turn into some nightmare monster that freakier than the last one you've seen and do some terrible thing that we haven't seen yet to the other person, yeah. or just what the people are going to do to each other in order right. to keep that from happening. Right. Yeah. So it's sort of a two pronged just like thriller it really is and then it definitely just goes full gore it just, horror it goes crazy. the whole when, shock uh, when the time comes yeah exactly and and one of yeah, one of them of was like work. yeah you know one of them was like describing it as a chameleon that strikes in the dark so it's very yes. very well well put i like how that that was the difference between this monster and the other one the thing from another planet from the 50s one is that it is a little more vulnerable in this one like if it just went out into the open on its own with against the whole group yeah it would just like it be would frozen die. to so death it has yeah to blend in so it has to yeah it has to get people alone and it establishes it as a little bit smarter like it wants to get away it wants to wait for the rescue helicopter right so it adds like some time stakes like they have to find a way to kill it before uh before it gets a chance to leave and it has to find a way to either kill or infect any everyone before the helicopter comes yeah exactly it has so much elements that you need to perfect in order to ultimately kill it off and it's it's a it's a hard it's a hard creature to kill so it's very very yeah, well it's done it's hard but it's doable it's doable which yeah it, uh, which which makes it realistic and yeah it grounds yeah, it a it little grounds it yeah exactly um, yeah and there's just so much psychological tension um, you know even with the doctor too, the doctor similar to the old film is trying to understand it. The doctor goes nuts too and destroys the communications devices so they can't contact the world. He wants he wants to, and then they have to confine him to the to the outside shed. And there's this kind of interesting uh, faith dynamic of them, of where you know Kurt just tells him like just to to trust the Lord is what he tells the doctor. So there's a very big faith and facts. Like what? What? What is real? What isn't? Kind of wavering of sanity. It's a lot of themes of like trust and paranoia that come up. It's like a really fucked up clue. It really is. It's it's a huge, huge fucked up clue. <laughs> so there's a lot of good tensions with that. There's a great scene where they're testing each other's blood, because they know that the thing has to survive no matter the cost. So if they try to zap the blood, they'll know what it is based on its reaction. And there's this whole like yeah total trust 
trust issues going on. And even Kurt Russell, he, he actually does shoot a guy who's who kind of attacks them, you know, just to survive. But he, he wasn't the thing. He was completely normal. So it was... Uh, yes, they tested his blood and they're like, you're a murderer. Yeah, you're a murderer. So there's a... Yeah, so it's like a... It's a very site like morals are down the drain. It's all about survival now, and it's it's quite scary. There's yeah, a very but big... the blood the blood test does does reveal one of the monsters. Yeah, it does. It's kind of a, a direct framing from the all body torching and stuff. They actually do that almost frame by frame of, of of that where the thing is going ballistic and then they burn it and then it jumps out the window into the snow, just like the what they did yep. in the fifties. So it was good good little uh, little callback. Except the ends is one with dynamite. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, at the end. Yeah, yeah. That's the spooky part because they go to check back on the doctor. And there's this nice looming noose that he made for himself that he didn't use. He's not on the noose, so, but he's like underneath the floorboards, tunneling, and creating this uh, saucer. You see this flying saucer in the tunnels, and you're like, oh no, it got to him. Dang. Shit, it got the doctor. Fuck. Got the doc. Not the. Not doctor. the doctor. But yeah, but yeah, there there is that nice uh, dynamite scene. I, it, it's very reminiscent of um, Ripley's, you know, get away from her, you bitch. And and Kurt's and Kurt's thing is like, yeah, fuck you too. <laughs> and he just throws the dynamite. It's pretty great. Oh yeah, it was his one liner <laughs> where he's like running away and he turns around and fuck you too. And then he throws the dynamite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah. yeah, and then he nukes the entire site from orbit. So there you go. <laughs> and then they nuke it from orbit. There are a lot of explosions in this movie. It is. It's a lot of fire and cold, which I thought was, when I was compiling my notes, it kind of dawned on me of, like, there is this heat and cold tug of war, uh, polar opposites type tension. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's you know, the thing versus mankind. It's this these polar opposites battling. And, uh, yeah, so it's kind of it's kind of cool. It's like that's a perfect thing to showcase with um, with that tension between the two creatures is heat and cold that they used. Um, but, yeah, so, yeah, very bleak, depressing end. You know, they nuked the entire thing, and uh, his friend actually survives the explosion, and you just don't know if the creature has infected one of them, Kurt or his friend. And, um, and they have a little bit of optimism at the end um, when, you know, they're like, yep, we, we did it but now we'll just see what happens and they just drink together and that's the end of the movie. <laughs> and you don't know if they survive, if one of them's the thing. I was looking at some theories bleak. on that. Dude. What's your interpretation of the ending? My interpretation, I think the... Well, what I would go with is that his friend um, is the thing and the thing has evolved and morphed even more based on its experiences and based on its learning capabilities and its assimilation into others. Oh. Um, so I feel like he's just, now he has the human behaviors down and he's just kind of kissing Kurt's ass at the end and drinking with him. And I think that might be my theory. Of, <laughs> and I, I don't know if help comes or not, I don't think they will because they had like two weeks of dead communication. So I don't think anyone comes to get them. So the thing might just die in the <laughs> ice until someone else uncovers it and thaws it out again. And the cycle repeats. Dang. I was walk- I was looking at some theories for the ending. And one of them was that, the, you know, because Kurt Russell, he blows up the whole thing. He kills the big monster. Yeah. And then he walks out with a with a bottle of liquor and he sits down and he hands it over to Childs, the other guy. And uh, I saw a theory that um, there wasn't whiskey in it. It was actually gasoline, and he handed it over to him to see if he would drink oh. it and pretend that it was that it was whiskey, and that's why he does a little smirk at the end. So it was either that or, oh, shoot. or Kurt okay. Russell's the, the alien. Yeah, okay. That's interesting. Oh, yeah. that's a the cool... The cinematographer... Yeah, that's a cool theory. I believe came out with a quote that um, they were using the reflection in people's eyes. Like, you know, if you could see the light in people's eyes, like reflecting off from lights and stuff. Oh. If, and everyone who had it was human and then when it showed people without it then you can kind of tell that they were the thing oh wow that's cool so that's really a lot cool. of people have been going back and looking, nice looking at the eyes of of the two guys yeah. at the end of the movie sitting down to see if one of them was missing the glow there's a lot of theories about the ambiguous ending of it which is great yeah and, th- and that's what's cool about the creature is that there's a lot of mystery surrounding where it's come from did they own that spaceship that crashed or did they assimilate to the pilots? You know, so there's a lot of cool mystery surrounding these creatures. Um, kind of similar to the to Alien, where you know you have the crashed engineered ship and they find the eggs and stuff, and they even find that the engineer, the the space, you know, the the pilot itself has his chest bursted. Did this vessel carry the eggs, or or did they crash land on the same planet and 
this planet harvests the parasites and it infected the ship itself. You know, like you never know. But then Prometheus, of yeah. course, goes in and screws the the whole and you know yeah. mystery behind they, it. <laughs> they did to the lore of Alien what uh what a Quiet Place did to <laughs> the concept of hiding your monster. Exactly. Yeah. And they just blew it. They just let it out in the open. Yeah. It's it's not fun. It's not fun when that happens. Moral of the story behind the thing behind all these movies is the best way to kill an unstoppable parasite alien is to burn explode or nuke the entire site from orbit because it's the only way to be sure that is the alien advice military action that's the american way yes yes if you guys find any unwanted aliens extraterrestrial or communist (laughs) just make sure you you follow those steps Follow the steps. Follow the advice of Alien. This has been a PSA been from a PSA. the good, the bad, and the boys. So, but this is what I'm. This is what the realization I've come to when compiling all these notes and comparing it to other films and comparing it to other things. I feel like it's Hollywood. It's a little realization of the Hollywood filmmaking and storytelling in general. I feel like. Every director is a parasite and has chosen to assimilate to other works of art um, as means of creative survival. <laughs> creative. Could this mean that the media is trying to feed and constantly assimilate? Is, is what we know one giant pulsating mass of imitation? One big rehashed and remade thing. Wow. And the the Good, the Bad, and the Boys podcast is just another poor science crew who's gone out there and discovered the horrible truth. And now we're next. And now we're next. And maybe we've assimilated. How do we know we haven't already been assimilated? Yeah, exactly. We're using... we're not just (laughs) some other parasite piggybacking off of the movie podcast platform. The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly... (laughs) My God, we were an alien. We didn't even know it. We oh already ripped God. off the good, the bad, and the ugly. Oh my! How many God. other movie podcasts exist? Oh my God! Oh my goodness! I can't believe it. I can't Cut believe the commercial. it. We need to talk about some things. We can stop this. Is we have to have a nuke of creativity to nuke Hollywood from from orbit. Nuke Hollywood from orbit. That will stop the superhero movies. Yes, that, that it's the only way to be sure. It's the only way to be sure. It's the only way to ensure another <laughs> Star Wars trilogy doesn't get made. Yes. We have to nuke Hollywood. Our podcast has been on the air for a week, and now we're going to get like labeled as domestic terrorists, <laughs> and uh, we're going to be put on a watch list. Yep. Some ATF guys are going to kick in our door. We're going to get red flagged online. Yep. CIA is coming after us. Yeah. Well, let us know what you think down in the comments. Is the entire entertainment industry a cry for help from people uh, trying to warn us about an alien parasite? Yes. Yes. Are we an alien parasite? Can you be sure we're not an alien parasite? You can't be too sure nowadays. So, you know, as you as you celebrate Halloween, yeah. just, just be careful. They walk among us. Watch out. You never know. And, Anyone uh, could be among us. Yes. and, and Even your co-host. And as the from another world stated at the end remember to keep watching the skies that is all for immigrants (laughs) and communists (laughs) and for communists wow and norwegians too (laughs) but yeah so that is that is uh that is my analysis of the thing um and its impact from another world nice yes Of, of the two which did you like better you know, I I think I liked the structure of the first movie a little bit more because it kind of laid out, you know, some of the themes and explorations of uh, of of what it means to be an alien life and what visitation and means. More and like the sci-fi concepts. Yeah, more explored. of those. Yeah, but I love, I just love the graphics and the realism that the '80s movie brings to the creature. It is probably the most realistic, horrifying creature I've ever. I think it's more horrifying than like Freddy Krueger and like some of the Hellraiser scariness and like some of the uh, 80s movie. I, I feel like this is this tops it. This might be the scariest creature. I don't know. Uh, yeah, for me, it'd either be that or the Xenomorph. Oh, yeah, Xenomorph. Well, yeah. Xenomorph Xen- just is a ripoff of this. I'm going to go with this. Xenomorph is pretty spooky too, but I feel like the thing is just so... It, it, it's the best one. Nice, yeah. Have you seen 2011 remake of The Thing? I did not. I considered watching it but i was like i don't yeah. i don't know if i want to give in to the parasitic nature of rehashing of hollywood <laughs> so <laughs> giving in the pet wow you're real you're more <laughs> kurt russell than i yeah when you uh when you said you were going to review this movie this week i considered reviewing the 2011 one oh, okay because i i had seen that movie 
a while ago uh, yeah. before I saw this one. Was it was it it's okay? Definitely or... not as good. Yeah. It leaned really heavily on like CG for for the monster, which made it look a bit more natural. It was I I, it, I think the eighty one the eighties one does it a little better. Yeah. This one is sort of like uh, realistic to like an uncanny valley mm. point where it just sort of detracts from how scary it is. Because it's 2011 CG, so it's not oh, right. super. Yeah. yeah. Still not glossy yet, you know, or like it's still not polished, but yeah. Yeah, the 80s one was honestly scarier because just because you know it's not CG and yeah. it's all real it's and just like, like the ooziness yeah. and the glistening just innards of things turning into outards and the creativity. This The 2011 one had a lot of like spider like imagery, hmm. which I don't know, it just wasn't as creative with it. You, you, di- you didn't get a madman to go in and design it. Yeah, you didn't get some... You didn't pluck your fucking production designer from the psych ward. Yeah. To... <laughs> exactly, yeah. And and yeah, and watching it too, man, I, man the, the practical effects are fantastic. I just... I, I miss that. I miss that in even modern horror films. Like, even A Quiet Place, I feel like would have... Could be kind of cool if it had that 80s aesthetic of the practical effects. It might be really spooky. The creature design of the Quiet Place was was cool. It was but, cool, you know, but again, yeah, their load too early. But it's still and, yeah, and it's still a little glossy with the CG. I feel like, but it's like it's, uh, but it's a good design. It's really realistic, animalistic. But yeah, but I, yeah, yeah, I miss those '80s prosthetics. It's kind of they're kind of cool. Well, we wouldn't be a movie podcast uh, site if we didn't have a pretentious view on CG and practical effects. So. <laughs> I, I suppose not. <laughs> Because we know all, we we are certified. Because we know all, we are we are the boy. I went to community college. Yes, I went to college for musical theater. I have a qualified opinion on film. So yeah, so I think we know a little more than the parasites in Hollywood. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and you should like and subscribe to this video right now because we are the best of the best. Right now, or you're a Hollywood parasite. Or you're a Hollywood parasite. Yeah, prove you're not a Hollywood parasite. Like right now and subscribe. Uh, Hold your hand over this candle. Okay, nice, beautiful. Wonderful. The thing. The thing. And now, let us summon the darkness, shall we? Or let us summon... Oh, God, I'm about to summon a fucking bottle of whiskey myself to talk about this thing <laughs> the thing this movie was written by i'm pretty sure the thing trying to be a hollywood writer and he just sort of attempted to copy a bunch of horror movie tropes <laughs> yes to to blend in and he's like yes yeah, this, this is legit i'm gonna totally pass but okay. <laughs> we summon the darkness oh, no. so we summon the darkness really came out last year at mammoth film festival and it was released this year on demand I, th- I watch it on Netflix, so if you guys want to watch it, it is free to stream on Netflix right now. But I Thank God it's free. It. <laughs> Thank God it's free. So quick sort of like spoiler-free synopsis. Uh, some friends in the 80s in Indiana, so Midwest U.S. in the 80s, amidst the, uh, the satanic panic, are going to a heavy metal concert. Yeah, so there's a satanic mm. panic heavy metal concert, and that's established it sort of early on in the film, uh, how satanic cults are are spreading through heavy metal and there's the news going on about some killings which they believe to be some serial killers in a cult going around the midwest killing people and they're following heavy metal bands on tour and so was there any mentions of of uh, dungeons and dragons the the evil of (laughs) dnd yeah do do they ever evil of dnd do do they touch Uh, up on that at all (laughs) no no no, they don't mention i think that's going to be the the Stranger Things season three is all the kids actually. They play enough D and D that um they just resummon the they monsters. They the, the mind. Player. That's actually what did it. Yep. That's the theory. That's the theory. Oh, it wasn't really? the secret science base. It was uh it was the kids. Oh, nice no, theory. That's okay. not an official theory. That's probably the theory of like Turning Point USA or something. <laughs> but no, <laughs> that's my new head cannon. The yeah. kids summoned it. Yeah, that's, that's actually pretty cool. Yeah, so we're good. They're unlocking other worldly. Christian dimensions and otherworldly yes. satanic dimensions I but suppose. yeah so we summon the darkness <laughs> <laughs> this film has an interesting cast it was directed by mark myers um who's then another horror flop it was my friend dahmer he did he did that one which was mm. a weird movie that kind of sympathized jeffrey dahmer but yeah but oh, this yeah, was, was produced by Zach efron too he made Jeffrey Dahmer looked like a look like Troy Bolton. <laughs> oh no, that was Zach Efron was in um extremely vile, wickedly cruel, something evil, whatever the judge said. But he was uh, he was Ted Bundy in oh, that Ted one. Oh, Ted Bundy. Okay, I'm getting yeah. my serial was, killers mixed up. Yeah, he was pretty good 
in that one. <laughs> okay. Get your killers straight, get Isaac. Killer straight. Your serial yes. killer lore. Oh, of course, yes. No, but yes. <laughs> this is, uh, so it takes place in the 80s at the height of Ooh. the USA killing Ooh. metrics. He man is bad. Ooh. Yep. He, ooh, he man. Yeah, so anyway, satanic panic's going on. Three girls are going to a metal concert. Uh, they meet some guys there. Uh, so now there's a group of six, three girls, three guys. Uh, the girls invite these guys back to Daddy's house, which is like some big mansion. And uh, horror activities, or at least what this movie thinks are horror activities, ensues. So it's a setup for a pretty typical slasher film. I liked the, the 80s <laughs> metalhead premise. Yeah, yeah, it's a good premise. Yeah, it's, you know simple and i think if yeah this movie does have a twist um and before i get into spoiler town i'll do a little spoiler free version of that although anyone sticking around at this point i think is accustomed to spoiler <laughs> yeah. but this movie has sort of like a twist and i want to say that it's a twist ending but they once again blow their load i think it's literally halfway through the movie they reveal sort of the the big plot twist of the movie the premise that it was going to ride on the whole time and they just do such a poor job of it. It was foreshadowed kind of well in like maybe the first first 30 minutes of it. But yeah, once you get closer to the reveal, it becomes like kind of really obvious what the reveal is going to be. Oh, and that's it unfortunate. It from all the clever foreshadowing yeah. that was done earlier in the film. Hitchcock would be displeased. And yeah, so <laughs> yeah it, makes the, it just makes the reveal really predictable. And, you know, as we discussed earlier in this episode, the best kind of horror is like the Hitchcock slow burn horror and this this one doesn't have that at all it doesn't even have jump scare horror i was scared zero percent of the time because the anticipation wasn't there because they did such a shitty job foreshadowing that you kind of knew what was coming and what was going to happen at any point in the movie and the movie doesn't really have any good jump scare it's more it's ugh, god the, this movie's filmed like a television show like it's a lot of just shoulder over shoulder there isn't really any creative camera angles the the fanciest they mm. do with it is just lower the camera to like knee height and look up. It, it seemed really boring from all the clips I watched. It's like, <laughs> oh man, it's super stale. Yeah. yeah, just very bland. I think horror movies are uh, one of the genres you can have, you can get the most creative with, with how, um, you know, framing goes and just sort of like the, the picture direction of it. Because, you know, you control what the audience sees. And in, in horror movies, what the audience doesn't see is just as important as what they do see. Or like we were saying. Right. And yeah, so this movie is just, it's, yeah, it's filmed like a Seinfeld episode. It's just very bland, very <laughs> stale, flat lighting. There's just nothing really, nothing from a production standpoint that would draw horror. Nothing from a plot standpoint that really builds tension. Nothing from a, a script standpoint, even just with like jump scares or anything that, you know, mm. would scare anyone. The characters are all unlikable, so you don't really have anyone to root for. It's just not good. It's just boring. It's just bland. It's not a good horror movie. I thought it was a better comedy than it was a horror movie <laughs> because it was established. Uh, it establishes, you know, all your like horror movie trope characters. The three girls we see at the beginning, there's Val, Alex, and um, and Beverly are the names of the girls. And we establish, you know, Beverly's like the quiet one. So I'm like, oh, look, the quiet virgin's probably going to be the one to survive. Alexis is like the bitch and Val's kind of like the comic relief. And gotcha. so, you know, I thought it was going to be sort of like a by the numbers slasher film. And that's why people thought it was boring. Yeah. And then the three guys, uh, they're also, you know, pretty basic characters. There's like the dreamy lover boy type who uh, respects women. Who the fuck does that? <laughs> he flirts with Beverly a little. So yeah, I knew right away they were probably going to be the two to survive. And then there's like, you know, the fat guy and then the drunk guy. And the whole, this, the entire movie rests on the twist, the twist ending, which isn't even the ending. It happens halfway during the movie. Oh, God. And um, so let's get into a little bit of spoilers now. So the movie's bad. It's bland. But <laughs> <laughs> we could go into why. It, the movie starts with sort of like the girls shopping. They're doing, like, they're looking at a news report of a pastor who's saying, you know, that these killings are from a satanic cult and that it's it's all their fault and to donate money to the church so that you don't get killed by satanists and they can combat them and uh, the girls Seems are legit. Know, all dressed in the 80s metal attire yeah this pastor is the guy he's played by johnny knoxville too oh he's, well, that's <laughs> even better oh yeah so johnny knoxville is a is like a fire and brimstone preacher <laughs> <laughs> and the other like big name in this is alexandra daddario who 
fans of good cinema would recognize as the girl from the Percy Jackson movies. Oh, and okay. Baywatch yeah. with Dwayne Johnson. Okay. Yep. Percy. Yeah. Yep, that's where I. Yep. Remember. <laughs> yep, yeah. Yeah. I bet you didn't. I bet you didn't think you'd have to remember Percy Jackson. Today. <laughs> I, no. No. It's so, so much horror <laughs> just uh, being uncovered today. Yeah. Speaking of horror, that book to film adaptation <laughs> was scarier than this. <laughs> yeah. She's in it. She actually produced the movie. So she's the big name, Johnny Knoxville, as well as uh, Keenan Johnson, who you might recognize from Alita Battle Angel. He was also in it. I did not see that movie, but yes. Yeah, proper weeb. This is an anime channel, Isaac. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think her big eyes were pretty scary, so I didn't I didn't, I didn't want to go see it. They're really big. Too waifu for you? Too, too waifu. Too waifu for you? Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, well. Did, uh, yeah, did so the, the whole... cast of Jackass, did they make a appearance at all? No, it was just Johnny Knoxville. And I, I don't know if the gag was that Johnny Knoxville is a preacher. Yeah. But, yeah. The big twist in this movie, I'll go into there, just because that, the whole, it's just the whole plot, and it's fucking stupid. The big twist in this movie is that you think it's gonna be sort of a slasher Among Us type scenario. It establishes the satanic cult pretty early on in the film, so you kind of know that that's gonna be sort of the villain. So I'm like, I don't know, maybe it's like some uh, wrong turn shit where they just end up with this cult. Maybe these guys are from the cult. There's a bit early on where they just sort of like babble back and forth. They're like, oh, yeah, how many people are dead at this point? 12, 15? <laughs> and then one of them very confidently answers 18. They're like, oh, yeah. So it's, I don't know. You think it's them just sort of reminiscing on their kills. Oh, okay. Yeah. And they go back to the house with these girls. And I, the reveal is done the stupidest way ever. It's done during a game of Never Have I Ever. <laughs> Oh. Which, have you played that? Yes, yes I have. Yeah. Well, for those who don't know, Never Have I Ever, you just go around in a circle and you say something that you haven't done. And anyone who has done it, they got to take a drink. Mm-hmm. And at, at one point during the, the, <laughs> the game, one of the girls just goes, Never Have I Ever Drugged Somebody's Drink. And then all three girls drink. So first of all, you played the game wrong, Alexandra oh. Daddario. <laughs> you have That would be a cool someone's. sequence. They put their hands down and then the boys start to drink it and they're like wait a minute <laughs> but yeah i guess they didn't play yeah, the game right well, that's pretty stupid they didn't play the game right yeah she's like never have i ever drugged someone's drink and so all the boys look around the circle and then all the girls take a drink and they're like wait what and that's another one of the problems with this movie is that it just drags out everything so long this movie it doesn't uh-huh. there's no horror in it it's like just bickering simulator they go back and forth for like five minutes like no whose drink did you drug and they're like you stupid boys he's like no <laughs> and then the boys start to drop like flies because they roofied them the big guy's like no i want to go home and I don't fucking, yeah like just pass out already because they go back and forth for a while the boys wake up and they're in a they're in a satanic summoning circle there's like skulls and candles and shit everywhere oh yeah i think the i girls saw that are standing scene, in front yeah. of them yeah, that's, yeah. that's the scene I looked on with YouTube. <laughs> I was like, ooh, <laughs> it's going to be that kind of movie. So that's huh? like the big twist is the girls that we've been following for the first third half of the movie are actually the killers. Mm-hmm. And I thought it was an interesting concept, but it could have been executed better. I uh, Again, you don't want to reveal your, your villain too early or your monster right. too early and let them see him right away. So when halfway through the movie, it was revealed that the girls were the killers and they had all three guys just sort of like tied up in chairs. I was like, where do we go from here? What what do we do now? We know that it's them. They've played their card. They drugged them and they got them tied up here. So one of them's probably going to get away and then I don't know, the rest of the movie's going to be them hunting him down. Yeah. I don't know. The dialogue is really awkward from here because it turns out that they reveal the other twist of the movie immediately after the first twist and it's that the girls uh the girls aren't actually in a satanic cult they're a part of like this evangelical coven (laughs) for wayward girls and they've been i guess it happens all over the country they're just like one cell and they go around uh, to places where metal tours are nearby and they kidnap people and they kill them and they make it look like it's a satanic cult like just to get people paranoid to join the church okay that's a interesting twist i guess but the whole movie rides on these twists and they just blow them all at once halfway through the movie Oof. like if they had paced it out a little better like you know had one um one reveal maybe you know two thirds quarter of the way through the other one like right around the end just to keep like a mystery up some element of suspense it would have been it would have been a little bit better yeah but yeah so it's realized that the three girlfriends are the killers and that they're not actually in a satanic cult they're just framing satanists as like 
the bad guys to get people to join the church. Hmm. Which, yeah, that was boring. What follows after that is another like 10 minute scene of just more bickering. They go back and forth about like the philosophy of being a metalhead, which I thought was <laughs> oh, just no. funnier than anything in this movie. It's, yeah. Is this the They're typical? Like, what are you boys doing? They're, you know. Yeah. It is way overdone. Yeah. I don't know. They tried to make like sort of like the the radicalized church members philosophy seem. I don't know what they try to make it seem. The girls just came off as like hypocritical as shit the entire oh, yeah. time. Yeah. But not to a point. I don't know. It really contradicted what they acted like for the whole first bit of the movie. Hmm. Especially because when they were all itched. Because, you know, the first bit of the movie followed just them. It was like alone on a road trip to go to this metal concert. But they were like dressed the part the whole time and they didn't do anything that would cue you on so that they were actually like modest evangelicals. And the yeah. same thing once they reveal that they're uh, that they're actually, you know, a part of this coven, they don't behave any differently than they did when they were putting on the facade. Right, yeah. As, you know, metalheads. They really could have played with that way more. It would have been a little bit more interesting yeah, if they you know, they had switched it up a little and yeah, showed like some drastic changes in character. I think Get Out did a good job of that more. Uh, spoilers yeah, for yeah. Get Out. Get Out is a perfect example but of that, yeah. It's a great example, yeah, with Chris's girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And they're, they had dropped hints earlier in the film that she was actually, you know, just, just sort of like the scout for this weird family surgery operation thing yeah. going on. And she actually acts way different than she does when she did when she was dating yeah. Chris. She's really like sort of the psychopath. They don't, yeah. Alexandra Daddario just starts get overacting as fuck. <laughs> I think just so she could be like a crazy person. Her eyes are just really wide for the rest of the movie, <laughs> but she doesn't really do anything different. And Val, yeah, Val, another one of the girls, sort of the comic relief character. She, um, her whole gag is that she has to pee a lot, <laughs> have a weak bladder. Oh and, my. Which I don't know. It was funny. Maybe the first three times they made the joke. Yeah, it just wasn't as much. I thought it was, you know, maybe a gag that was established at the beginning to be like, oh, she's going to die while peeing or something. Yeah, have some but, type you know, of payoff. Maybe killer set. Maybe she... That was maybe the only expectation. Like, maybe, <laughs> like, before the, uh, like, ritual happens or before they kill, they're like, oh, I have to use the bathroom real fast, so she has to go exit. Literally. They perform the ritual, someone gets away, and then there would have been a cool, like, where she steps out of the bathroom while he's trying to escape, and that would have been kind of a cool, you know, neat little bit or something, I guess, a little payoff to that yes, gag. something. But. If they did s <laughs> something, anything with the concept other than what they did, Anything other than this movie would have been great. Yeah, so one of the boys is going back and forth with Alexandra Daddario's overacting ass, and she kills him. And uh, this is the other twist of the movie that was just really predictable, is that one of the girls hasn't done this before. She's she's new. She's like some girl they picked up off the street, and this is sort of like they're sort of inducting her into the church through this ritualistic murder, Satanist framing thing. Mm. And she gets cold feet. Which it was established early on that her and guy from Alita are sort of like googly eyes at each other. And he just mm. keeps flashing her the, the fucking, I don't know, he's giving her like fuck me eyes like in the middle of them getting murdered. <laughs> don't know why. But yeah, Jesus. she gets cold feet. She pulls the other girls aside. Um, but she's, you know, been sort of pseudo radicalized. So she wants to, uh, she kind of does want to kill him. And which also just adds to how her character is so unlikable because she goes from completely willing to kill these guys because they were talking about why they were metalheads to yeah. not wanting to. And it's for the dumbest reason, too. I don't know. <laughs> so it's, later, it's later revealed that Johnny Knoxville is the, the true villain. He sets all this up, his like, you know, because his church, the donations that they get, he says he uses to set up like programs for wayward girls. It turns out that program is just turning them into killers and that he pockets all the money mm. and that's why they live in this bougie ass house oh, okay yeah but this this girl discovers this the, the new girl in like a shed that he keeps all his money in which is in cash for some reason along with all the files of his evil doings and i'm like why is this in a shed next to a weed whacker <laughs> first of all that's a that's a horrible it yeah that, that doesn't make any sense it's in like an unlocked tackle box sitting in a shed that she goes into so that they could get a weed whacker to kill the boys with but yeah so <laughs> it's a horrible she, setup she pulls, it's, it really is just a terrible setup uh, for a character or again none so of these bad. characters are likable yeah. <laughs> yeah they um so she pulls him aside to talk about how she wants to kill him and uh and the boys they manage to get out uh and then 
instead of running away, they like run into the kitchen and they see the girls in there and the girls all have knives and they try and fight them. <laughs> and this is where I think my favorite aspect of this movie comes in is that I don't know who the choreographer was, but they have no idea how the human body works. Everybody uh, is made of paper mache in this movie. Oh, amazing. Like everyone just, <laughs> yes, everyone is very delicate. So one of these guys grabs a pan and as the girls like rush them with knives, but they do it in like, a, <laughs> like the dumbest. It's like in one of those dumbass action movies where a person is surrounded and the enemies still run at them one at a time. Oh yes, yep. That's what that's what these girls do. They that's so they rush them, but smart. they don't really. They run at them one at a time with knives. He <laughs> just sort of like bonks them on the side with a pan, and they just hit the floor. <laughs> 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 it's like the vine of the girl sneaking up on her mom or dad or whoever it was to scare him, and they turn around, and they just whack him with a pan, <laughs> and they just they hit the deck. Ooh. It's like that, yeah. Okay. So he smacks two of them with pans, and one of them cuts his friend in the arm. She, like, grazes him with this knife, and he puts his hand over his arm, and then the boys run, and they lock themselves in the pantry. And some more paper mache shit. The guy who got a light cut on his arm with the kitchen knife, like, pulls his hand away. And he's just bleeding profusely. Oh, no. Yeah, the makeup department, like, couldn't be fucked to um to make it look like a real laceration. Uh, so they just had, like, a fucking red line and marker on him. And they were just like, uh, let's just pump all the blood we have in the proper amount of this arm wound. And, and that'll be realistic enough. Oof. Yeah, after watching videos for, like, how The Thing does body horror and how this movie does is, yeah. And that's, like, the first slash we've seen. Can't really hire Rob Botten, but... <laughs> <laughs> With this budget. Oh, God. And this movie flopped, too. This movie made $164,000 oh. total. Oh, wow. <laughs> worldwide. <laughs> I can't even find the budget for it on Google. <laughs> they won't release it. I don't, I've gone on a lot of different sites, and I cannot find Taren, the budget for this they're movie. They're already ashamed. Don't don't add more fuel. They don't. Yeah. It's like the they're like fucking Ignite trying to release their financials they just won't do it <laughs> yeah so that amounts to like two knife wounds that we've seen this entire movie and we're like an hour in to the slasher uh, movie yeah yeah it's once just not scary at all and they just go back to bickering through the door um the girls are trying to find ways to to flush the boys out they run at the door doesn't do anything yeah just shit like that they spray like insect killer in there and one of the boys, the other guy, again, paper mache world, they spray some insect killer in the room and fill it up with gas. And one of the boys immediately starts, like, coughing up blood. That's how that works. I don't know if it was, yeah, from two breaths of wasp killer or from the light graze he got on his arm from a knife wound. <laughs> but this guy, his hemophiliac ass is just, he's losing it. Oh, no. <clears throat> yikes. Yeah, yikes. So some other people show up, like, Alexandria Daddario's stepmom shows up uh, to, like, I don't know, riff cocaine or something, and she stumbles upon the body, and they gotta kill her, and then a sheriff shows up, and they kill him in the in the dumbest way. They just, yeah, they, like, sneak, they just steal his gun and shoot him with it, and it's just, there's just no stakes, there's no tension, it's boring, mm. the killers were revealed halfway through, just yeah. the for it to amount to nothing there's yeah. i think a total of like four knife wounds for a slasher movie one of which was fatal there was missed potential there was so many much things that they could have because it was a good premise it was a good interesting idea but like like even the the girl who was like a little unsure about everything like she could have been the hero or you know or like she could have turned she does she just does it in the dumbest way possible and it, exactly like i thought was going to happen at the beginning of the movie oh, it's no. you know dreamy boy with an 80s mullet and the girl with cold feet are the only ones to survive yeah yeah, yeah but <laughs> my favorite part of the movie was when johnny knoxville showed up again i was like he he probably cost way too much money to just be in like a <laughs> off-handed did he did he absorb the, the entire budget of this movie <laughs> probably yeah the entire production budget just went to casting johnny knoxville and Daddario in this movie. Daddario, who produced it. <laughs> and I was like, mm, half this budget could probably go to my salary. Knoxville no, just turns I, to the I, I camera and he's like, you're a jackass for watching this movie. <laughs> and yeah, then the crew really of was. jackass shows up. And then the movie. <laughs> and then ends, the crew of jackass the shows up. Credits roll. <laughs> it just, the camera pans to the crew of the of the Sum of the Darkness, and, and it's all <laughs> the jackass crew. 
<laughs> it's all the jackass crew. So, yeah, we, with uh, the cameras. Yeah. <laughs> no, I yeah, don't know. Jesus fuck, dude. That that would have been a better ending than than what we got. The ending <laughs> of this movie was, you know, cold feet girl turns against her friends. They have the dumbest fight. Again, the choreography in this movie is shit. Everyone is made of paper mache. Mm. She like effortlessly fights off the other two girls who try and kill her, one of whom has like a knife and the other one is behind her and jumps on her back. They just go flying away. Johnny Knoxville shows back up. It's revealed that he is uh, Daddario's dad, so she's oh, okay. the she's the daughter of the the preacher. He's like, "Wow, you really fucked this up, didn't you?" <laughs> and then once again, they don't know how to foreshadow, so it just comes off as like a really long, drawn out reveal. Uh... He's like, "We're gonna have to do something drastic to get the media off of us. Something, something crazy, something to our." Something to our family that that no one's gonna see coming, Ooh. and like it's obviously he's, he's gonna fucking kill his daughter, and she's just staring at him like a dipshit. Like, yes, daddy, what is it? Uh. Gee, I wonder. <laughs> he's looking at her with fucking like murder eyes. <laughs> so yeah, he tries to kill her, but the other girl like saves her, and then she tries to kill the other girl, and and what was probably the one of the funnier sequences of this movie. They have this, like, potato fight, and uh, <laughs> Alexandra Daddario, she doesn't even get thrown or, like, pushed or anything. It, what it, the way it looked is she, like, tripped over, <laughs> she, like, tripped over dreamy lover boy's, like, dying body, and she went flying. It looked like, <laughs> it literally looked like one of those TikToks where, like, someone trips, and then it just shows, like, a fake, like, ragdoll body flying down oh, the stairs. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was like that, yeah. So she trips, she flies out the window over the like balcony roof of the house and then falls two stories. This choreography, this this stunt work had to have been the direction of the Jackass crew. I'm certain of it. it had to... <laughs> of the, yeah. It was some jackass physics for sure. Everyone just goes <laughs> flying about. It's no, it's no John Wick. Yeah. It was like some massacre at the Grand Canyon ass Ooh, fight scenes. Yeah. Everyone's like Abrupt swan fight. diving. Yeah. Nice, okay. Random fight scenes, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, and that's really just the shtick with the movie. The performances were all right. I think my favorite one was Val, the comic relief girl. It was very, it didn't fit the movie at all, but just the way her character was written and like the lines that she got and stuff, I think that actress, that actress, Maddie Hassan, she, mm. she probably did the best job oh, out of them okay. all. The Dario was like comically insane, which I don't know. This movie wasn't, I don't know. It's it, none of the categories I saw it on were horror comedy, and I don't think that was what they were going for. It was like a horror comedy. Oh no! It, <laughs> but that's what I felt like it was. Cause it's a horror comedy. Nice. All right. Because it, it was a horror comedy, uh, minus the horror. Oof. Yeah. So, I don't know. That yeah, the movie just it botched all of its twists. It ruined its own premise. Um, no, nothing was scary. I wasn't scared the entire time. There wasn't even any good, like, gore horror or building of suspense. There wasn't even any jump scares in this movie. At mm -hmm. least, you know, other modern horrors could at least, like, you know, be fucked to throw in a jump scare now and then just to keep you on your toes. Yeah. This one was just... This doesn't do anything. It was nothing. It was nothing. Yeah. I, I and remember the... And the was yeah. so stupid. I uh, remember watching that video, like, when they were revealing their... You know, they had the, the satanic circle, but, yeah, it was just so boring. I... I I I'm always like stressed when I look back to some of those horror films, but like this, seeing this scene, I was like, I I wasn't stressed at all. It was so bad. I was like <laughs> I am so glad I don't get yeah. to watch all of this, and I can just stick with the thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you 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 be glad. You appreciate that. You appreciate <laughs> your Hollywood conspiracy. Cause I got some hot shit for this one. <laughs> yeah, it was just like that. The ending was stupid. They like knock out Johnny Knoxville, but they don't kill him. They just leave. So he, I guess, won in the end because his daughter died. You know, he got the media off his back, and this was like a massacre in his own house, and the satanic symbols were still everywhere. So everyone thinks it was a, another cult killing. And then the other two just leave. They just drive off into the sunset together, and that's it. Oh. Yeah, it wasn't good. So, you know, a little overacted in some places, underacted in others. Very inconsistent in that department. Plot was stupid not scary at all they didn't do anything with any horror elements like you know a slasher film usually would have at least in you know things like friday the 13th as it got you know a little memeier once you get to you know fucking the oh, seventh, right. eighth, yeah. ninth, 10th 
yeah. <laughs> sequel. The uh, the killings at least get a little more creative. Right, right. And I think that's that's one of the the highs of of sort of like the slasher film subgenre is the ability, you know, just to see just you know seeing the killers in action. Um, Because it's not like a monster movie where you want to hide your monster. This one is, you know, slasher, person with a knife, going around killing people in fun, creative ways. Like, uh, I like the Friday the 13th kills the best, you know, just Jason doing dumb shit. Oh, for sure. Put someone in a sleeping bag and he, like, beats him against a tree. That's uh, one (laughs) of the greatest kills of all time. (laughs) Yeah. That's, That's a favorite. Oh, man. Yes. Yeah, and the camera work again, nothing creative with that. Even in the most recent Halloween one, which it was all right. I like this. There was a fun sequence where it was like a minute, three minute long, long take mm. of just Mike Myers walking through a residential area on Halloween. Yeah. <laughs> and you know everyone's out and about, just going around having a good time. And as soon as he sees someone alone, he just is on this killing spree. Just walks around. He sees some dude in his garage. He walks in there and he murders him. Yeah, he sees some lady cooking. He just murders her and takes the kitchen knife. And then he goes to the next house and does the same thing. And it's all like a long take, sort of shown through perspectives that right, yeah. you know regular people walking around on the street wouldn't see. Exactly. Yeah, I didn't like that movie much, and I like that about it. At least it has something memorable about it. This movie had yeah. there's no horror elements to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. There's no. Maybe if they leaned into the horror comedy aspect of it yeah it might have worked a little i don't bit think better it that worked. way yeah yeah i wouldn't have worked i don't think with this premise very much but it would have worked better than what we got <laughs> right yeah there's there yeah, were it's, yeah, yeah. it's very boring very bland <laughs> the only thing this is maybe the first movie i reviewed so far that's kind of a so bad it's good kind of it is barely edging into that zone everyone is so stupid oh, okay. in this and it's just such a bad horror movie that it's almost comical I like the fight scenes a lot just for how bad they are. (laughs) It was really funny when you see, yeah, it's kind of like this is a good, a lot of cuts. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is is this, this is a good, like friend roast, like hangout movie to watch. Yeah. This this would be a good movie to drink too. Okay. (laughs) Well, uh, I'll put out a drinking game on social media for this movie Perfect. (laughs) that you guys can, you can drink to this movie and watch night before Halloween. That's that's fantastic. With your friends. Yes. (laughs) I'll get you in the mood. The spooky mood. But that's it. And yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, yeah. I did want to ask you, what's what is your favorite what is your favorite slasher movie? Slasher movie, I, I'd go with uh, Which you would recommend. Yeah. Um I, I would definitely yeah, a slasher film for sure, I would say go with the original Halloween. I actually really did enjoy the latest Halloween as well. I thought it was like a faithful revisit of the old classic. But I I understand that it might not appeal as much to other people the the newest one but yeah i i would say it was all right yeah yeah i i enjoyed it but yeah i I would say go with the classic um john carpenter 1978 i believe and yeah it's uh that's that's probably one of his best works and what really imagined the slasher genre itself and it's 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 great yeah that did really define it i would agree that or like friday the 13th I think are some of the yeah. best ones. Yeah, Friday the Thirteenth. Yeah. At a least the meme-ier. first one is really interesting. If you want a little bit more of that scary aspect, but yeah, if you're looking for some good, just some funny deaths and yeah, and the stuff, first few are just... scary enough. But there's like some fun kills in it, and then yeah. by the time you get to fucking Friday the Thirteenth, ten, Jason <laughs> yeah. in space, Jason in space, to me, yeah, Jason takes Manhattan, all that. It's like it's yeah, it goes <laughs> it goes nuts. But yes, yes. yeah, um, even. F- like nightmare on elm street is kind of like a d- dark uh horror comedy i would say i mean it's not really comedy but freddy is kind of he's very quippy and kind of funny himself he's he's got like the funny witty i don't know yeah he really freddy really revels in his kills yeah and um, i like the creativity of the premise of it and yeah, how freddy can kind of be whatever he wants in people's dreams exactly yeah there's there's some good you know 80s uh practical effects with that same with the thing some good shocking horror to it so yeah i definitely recommend any of those the classics um anything recently that came out that you'd recommend any recent horrors yeah. um it follows is a really good monster one that is a very slow Ooh. burn horror I've even just seen the concept of it yeah of the std monster yeah gonna get you yeah I, that I'd one's say, really good yeah I think Hereditary is a good one too, and if you want to watch Midsummer right, yeah. back to back, Ari Aster stuff, yeah, is really good. Hereditary yeah, a good back and back. Midsummer, yeah, that's a good one. Those are a little more psychedelic. I've been getting real into the psychedelic horror genre. My yeah. favorite movie is The Lighthouse. 
Oh, but she's right, yes, horror. Lighthouse. It's more of like a thriller. Oh, my goodness. We highly recommend It's like a the thriller, lighthouse. dark comedy. <laughs> the Lighthouse, it, highly recommended by the boys. I eagerly await the week that we review oh, the Lighthouse. Yeah, we... I have too many things to say about it. Yeah, I can't wait to dive into that one. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be good. All right, nice. Yeah, yeah, those are official recommendations from the boys. Hit us up on social media. Drop your favorite horror movie and why. Who's your favorite monster movie? Your favorite scariest movie monster? Favorite slasher film? Yeah, let's talk. We want to hear it, even though... Yeah. Yeah, even if we've reviewed these ones this year, I want to watch some more before Halloween. So yeah, for sure. Tell yeah, me what to and watch. Comment down below too about what we've reviewed and what you think about them if you've seen them, and yeah, let us know. Maybe things we missed and things that you liked and whatnot. So yeah, let us know. Also, yeah, I wanted to give a, right. a little shout out to um, to my cousin Josh. He's a huge horror uh, fan. He was also recently in a movie that was filmed in Colorado. Um, it was called Rent a Pal. Um, you can stream it on I, I streamed it on Amazon Prime Video. But yeah, you can get it on some of those sites and um, yeah, really really interesting psychological, more of a thriller movie I would say, um, and about like relationships and isolation and loneliness. Really interesting film. It has Will Wheaton in it too, um, who was I think was the Your stand by me. In that? Yeah, I Will saw Wheaton. Like yeah. trailers for that. Yeah, so he's in that. He's uh, he's the rent a pal dude. Um, and my cousin, he oh, makes a cameo God. as one of the. Um, he he's like the camera man in one of the scenes. So you'll see him. He he's got a Reagan Bush '84 uh, shirt on. So you can't miss him. But uh, <laughs> but yeah. So wow, really fitting the boys' theme. The takeaways from this episode: the the fucking <laughs> the Reagan era philosophy. Reagan of era the philosophy. And the boys. Yes burn your commies yes the end end the cold war um but yes yeah go go check them out check out that movie if you're looking for something a little little spooky to watch this month and uh yeah it's pretty good i really enjoyed it so and check him out on instagram too he goes by josh staub um he's got a fun little character james ripton he does a lot of movie reviews he's he's a really cool guy he's really funny and stuff so check him out also a uh, huge shout out to the graphic designer who did our banner for YouTube and Twitch, good friend Jesse. You can find him online. Uh, his Instagram's King Maverick. He also has some other social media plugs. Link in the description below. Uh, hit him up for graphic design. And be sure to check out our YouTube page and our Twitch page. We will be streaming games, both good and bad, so you can get a little sneak peek at where we're going to be reviewing. But also hit us up, and you can play with us, whatever you want. You can hear this, introduce us to your best and worst games yeah you might review them for sure check us out on youtube we got more podcasts there as well as some short sketches oh yeah and uh yeah remember folks to have a safe and happy halloween and remember to keep watching the skies (laughs) (laughs) is he fucking eating the cigar you just put off the filter end was it (laughs) 